best evidence for evolution, he responded by saying it is systematic phylogenetics. And he said in his little three-minute YouTube clip, the only way Hoven can counter that is to meet the phylogeny challenge, which no creationist will ever, will ever even attempt to do. Okay. <clears throat> First place, I'll help correct you a little bit here, Arndt. It is phylogenetic systematics, not systematic phylogenetics, but that's okay. Uh, according to uh, evolution.berkeley.edu, all life on Earth is united by evolutionary history. We are all evolutionary cousins, twigs on the tree of life. Phylogenetic systematics is the formal name for the field within biology that reconstructs evolutionary history and studies the patterns of relationships among organisms. Unfortunately, history is not something we can see. That is correct. Phylogenetic, from the dictionary, uh, uh, di just Googled it on uh, Google here, relating to the evolutionary development and diversification of a species or group of organisms or of a particular feature of an organism, for instance, the teeth or the bone structure, etc. And I'm holding in front of me, I'll show it from Encyclopedia Britannica 2005, a phylogenetic tree based on the nucleotide differences in the gene for cytochrome C. And they have all these creatures with lines drawn between them, showing that a human, a monkey, a dog, a horse, a pig, etc., and a, a moth, and a screw worm, and a tuna are all related to a common ancestor. They draw these lines on the paper, and that becomes their science. Now, I'm curious, why did they choose to use the phylogenetic tree based on cytochrome C? Why did you make a tree based on the number of chromosomes? Or based on the adult body weight? Or based on life expectancy? Or based on life, or gestation period? or based on average number of offspring, or based because on the number they of teeth. have to focus on derived synapomorphies. All of these things are features, and if you do a phylogenetic tree on any of these things, you get a wildly different tree. For example, penicillin has two chromosomes. Houseflies and tomatoes both have 12. If you did a phylogenetic tree, you would say houseflies and tomatoes are identical twins. Possum, redwood tree, and kidney beans all have 22 chromosomes. They are not identical triplets. Humans have 46 chromosomes, and chimpanzees and tobacco both have 48. So if you did a phylogenetic tree based on anything other than what you want to believe, that there's somehow a relationship, you would get wildly different answers. So I think the evidence shows very clearly that you're choosing and selecting a particular phylogenetic tree that anybody can make up. You can arrange things in any kind of order you want and draw lines between them, but all the phylogenetic trees are nothing but lines on paper that somebody decided to make a relationship. Like you think a pine tree and an elephant are related. That's a line on a piece of paper, Arne. That's not science. Science is something we observe, we study, we test, we demonstrate. Everybody that's ever done it will tell you elephants make baby elephants. No exceptions. Now, if you choose to believe, and I emphasize the word believe because it is a religious belief that you have, that elephants and pine trees are related, that's fine. I don't care what you believe. But I resent paying for that to be taught to all the kids in the school system. That is not science. That's a religion in every sense of the word. Go ahead. In no sense of the word is that a religion because it is not faith-based. It's evidence-based. And it has nothing to do with any purpose for anything, much less anything to do with the beginning of the universe or what came prior to it. Nor does it require a belief. I would suggest that we both start from not believing anything and just review the possibilities. And one of the things we have to look at is the law of monophyly, which is an evolutionary law. This is the one that Ernst Mayer described as Darwin's second law of common ancestry. And this is where he says that uh, multiplication of species is uh, Darwin's third law. And this is the one that I refer to as biodiversity. In either case, it means that one species may diversify into two, into four, and eight, and several. But that in um, every daughter lineage, evolution is just a matter of superficial changes being compiled against uh, successive tiers of fundamental similarities. And it is those tiers of fundamental similarities which can be interpreted as derived synapomorphies, which is what they're basing the phylogeny on. I have heard creationists argue that a watermelon is 98% water and a cloud is 100% is, is water, and so a watermelon only missed being a cloud by 2%. Or that we could classify an octopus as being an ink pen since it spits ink, and we can classify it as a spider because it has eight legs. And these are all deliberate attempts to avoid the fact. Again. Avoid the fact of what? That an octopus is related to an ink pen? What, say, you say understand the law of monophyly, but as I just described, it means that you can't outgrow your ancestry. That means at no well, point in evolutionary history did one <clears throat> kind, which doesn't exist, ever become another kind, which doesn't exist either. You just told me that elephants and pine trees are related. You do right, believe still different eukaryotes, kinds. Aren't they? So that is the, that's so all they're it takes. So they're still eukaryotes, aren't they? So that proves they're related. Are they still eukaryotes or no? 
Yes. Does that prove okay, they good. related? And they never they never became a different kind. Ever. Did so they? your de your definition of kind would include a pine tree and an elephant as the same kind of creature. Are they both eukaryotes or no? <laughs> Are you drunk? Are they both eukaryotes? <laughs> yes. Okay. This then, is then they insane. are both the same kind in that respect, right? 